Rice Chex and Wheat Chex, the bite-sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! <laughs> In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are approaching a hideout near the Saturn City spaceport where two criminals are plotting a getaway. Ray guns in hand, the Space Patrollers burst through the door. All right, both of you, get your hands up. Hold it, Paris. You heard the commander. Move away from that table, Kent. Move fast. Sure. Now, Corey, this is a blaster. Drop that ray gun. Don't be a fool, Kent. You're through. You haven't got a chance. You fire, so will I. And remember, a blaster is permanent. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting space patrol adventure, The Counterfeit Atom. Hey, space patrol, it's getting kind of late, and I'm getting kind of hungry. Hey, let's take time out for a big bowl full of rice checks. Well, Captain Pico, rice checks, tops with me. Tops with me, too, space patroller, and it'll be tops with you, gang, tops three ways. For taste, for size, for get up and go. There's one. And there's one for me. Space Patrollers, when you fill up your old bowls with those neat, triple toasted spreaded rice biscuits, you're getting one spoonful after another of the easiest, tastiest, bite-sized eating ever. Because rice checks are tops for taste and size. Tops for get up and go, too. Why, mornings after you finish off a good, nourishing breakfast with rice checks, you're ready to swing into action. If you like whole wheat, try Wheat Checks. It's top two. Yes, look for Rice Checks and Wheat Checks in the red and white checkerboard packages with the picture of Commander Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside. Rice Checks. Wheat Checks. And now today's Space Patrol adventure, the counterfeit atom. All over the solar system, dealers and collectors of precious stones are alarmed over the mysterious disappearance of several valuable gems. Losses have been reported by jewelers and private collectors on Earth, Mercury, and Mars. The latest victim is the Terra Gem Company. Local agents are completely baffled, so Commander Corey has personally taken over the investigation. With Cadet Happy, Buzz is in the vault of the Terra Gem Company, questioning the manager, Doran Chandre. You're absolutely positive, Mr. Chandre, that those two diamonds are the only... But I almost wish to see that you seemed out half the world from left those two stones. The combined value is more than a meaning set. You, uh, used the word, too. But couldn't the diamonds have been mislaid instead of stolen? No, uh, no. I placed them in the vault myself last night. Well, but there's no sign that the vault was broken into. And you told us that you were here this morning when the time lock opened it. Yes, I know. Of course, there are customers who do this after handling costly gems. We don't mislay stones of that value. Oh, who beside yourself has handled those gems? Several persons. All with complete respectability, you may be sure. And always within my presence. And except when they're in the vault, the stones were never out of the sun. No. Well, uh, that's not exactly true. I permitted three persons to retain them for a few hours for a private mistake. For central buyers. Yes. Of course, they all returned again. To me personally. And they were thoroughly done. Mm, to be sure that no imitations have been switched on? Exactly. I can assure you the real gems went back into the... Chandra, I want the names and a complete description of everyone who showed an interest in those stones. Hmm. This case of yours follows the same pattern as the other disappearances. In the absence of clues, I have to start with the men who were interested in those diamonds. No, all right, Commander. If you come into the office, I'll give you all the information. In an expensive suite at the Terra Hotel, a dignified, distinguished-looking man sits under a bright light, examining a large diamond through a magnifying glass. His companion nervously toys with a smaller stone and finally speaks. Let's put them away, Ken. Looking at them isn't going to make them any bigger. This one is truly magnificent, Ferris. What a shame to have to break it up. We'd better get off Terra. Chandra has probably discovered he's been robbed by now. Robbed? All we can be sure of is that his diamonds have vanished. There's nothing to implicate me or you. Now that we're leaving anyway, the jeweler in Jupiter City has some gems in which I'm interested. Yeah. Yes, sir. Something on your mind? I was wondering. This machine of ours, can we make just as much money by using the 
legitimately? Then I'd suggest that our operation is illegal. I think you are too angry, isn't it? There's no law against using our equipment. There's no one but us knows it exists. So I borrow trouble. Now run along, Ferris. Get our machine aboard our spaceship. I want it ready for use when I reach Jupiter City. Back in Space Patrol headquarters, Buzz and Happy carefully go through all the data available on the strange disappearances of jewels. After hours of checking and cross-checking, the commander points to a ruled chart. Putting all the cases together, Hap, there are only two factors in the Yes, sir. The disappearances have occurred with firms that have advertised an exhibition of a particularly valuable piece of jewelry, or a famous collection. Uh-huh. And what's the other? Uh, I've been checking to see if any name occurs more than once among the lists of prospective buyers. Two of the names Chandra gave me appear twice. There's another dictation on Mercury and Mars. Well, that means that some of these men have shown up at more than one jewelry store. Uh, that's must be expected. The wealthy collector might have a hobby of traveling around expecting gems. I'm happy. Here's one name that appears in all the lists. James Kent. Kent has always asked to examine the gems privately. So he's always attended and abducted. In some cases, other persons handle the jewels after Kent gave them back to the jeweler. Well, maybe someone Kent trusts goes around with them, gets a line on the gems, and steals them later. Mm, except that still leaves the mystery of how the gems disappear. Well, mm-hmm. the only thing to do is have an agent follow Kent and see who hangs around him. Mm-hmm. There's one strange thing about Kent. Well, possibly it's due to a faulty memory on part of the jeweler, but no two descriptions quite match. Well, but these jewelers must know him or they wouldn't let him take the stones. Mm-hmm. Kent has excellent credentials and appears to be quite wealthy and been staying at the Terra Hotel. He's checking out. He has reservations on a passenger ship to Jupiter City. Jupiter City? Hey, we're due there for an inspection. Mm-hmm. Oh, the actual crook must be a magician. All those jewelers insist the gems were locked in their vaults. I'm going to alert the biggest jewelry firms in Jupiter City to notify Space Patrol headquarters and to let out any really valuable articles on the I'm going to install a special detecting device in the vaults. All right, Hap, let's clear up this routine so we can blast off to Jupiter. Twenty-four hours later, in one of the finest rooms of the Hotel Jupiter, James Kent and Ferris examine an array of jewels. Interesting assortment, Ferris. However, we'll settle for the emerald necklace. That can't, that doesn't make sense. It's going to take a long time to duplicate each one of those stones. The three big rubies are worth more. Well, I can turn them out in a half an hour. Yes, but the emeralds are smaller. I can easily dispose of them separately without cutting them. The rubies would be a problem. Well, it's a shame to let them go. Just take the emeralds, Ferris. Can you finish the job in two hours? Yes, yes. You know, Ken, I wish we could perfect that thing so it would duplicate currency. Then we wouldn't have to go through all this hocus pocus with the jewelry outfits. Currency is too complicated. The plant fiber that's the basis of the paper is organic material. Now, that means a complex molecular structure. And those coins came out very well. Not sure, but nobody ever got rich counterfeiting coins. No, right now, gems are our best bets. We can transform energy into minerals and metals. And with a real gem for a model, we can easily turn out exact duplicates atom by atom. It's too bad our imitations don't last. They last long enough for our purpose. Now, you better get going first. I want to get the counterfeit necklace and the real rubies back to the Imperial Jewelry Company before closing time. Late that night, Buzz and Happy are at the Jupiter City Space Patrol Headquarters. Preparing a report on an inspection when a call comes from Special Agent Edwards assigned to duty at the Imperial Jewelry Company. Rushing to the store, they're admitted by Edwards and walk to a dimly lit showroom to a huge vault. Edwards, you're sure no one beside yourself was in the building? No, Commander. I was hiding out in the back room with the portable receiver turned on. Somebody had lit up by the rest of the vault. Hmm. Vault door is closed. No, as far as I can tell, it hasn't been tampered. Well, then what made the receiver light up? Something must have happened inside the door. Detectives are sensitive enough to register any slight movement or change in temperature. Transmitted the signal to Edward's receiver. Uh, you could open the vault now, Edward. I cut off the master time clock control at headquarters after I got your call. All right, Commander. Commander, this It's swinging open. Edwards, do you have a list of the jewels that have been checked out of the store? Yes, sir. I got it from the manager when he closed up. I watched the manager when he put them in the vault to be sure I was there. Let's check it over. All your stuff for anyone asked to inspect is all right there on that page after you ordered, sir. All right, Edward, let's take inventory. Mm-hmm. Deep star sapphire ranger, huh? Yeah? 
Ruby. They're the most valuable items. Thank goodness they're here. Who had them out? James Penn. He also had the... The necklace. Gone. The necklace? That right away. He had the necklace. Well, if the emerald necklace is gone, why not the rubies and those other jewels? Well, how do we know for sure that no one entered the vault? We really got a mystery in there. Huh? Could the emeralds have just uh, disintegrated? Evidently, yeah, they did. The detective registered their disappearance. Well, the point emeralds this time and diamonds another. And always the jewels that have been out on approval. James Kent is the only constant factor in the whole problem. I don't see how he could have any more to do with this than you do. Oh, how about that man that called on him at the Hotel Jupiter? Uh, this guy, Ferris. Uh, Ferris seems to work in a machine shop on Cutler Street. One of our agents placed him there. Well, we've got to start somewhere. Edwards, you go to the Hotel Jupiter and get a line on James Kent. Yes, ma'am. Perhaps you and I'll drive over to Kepler Street and see if we can find Ferris. In the back part of a darkened machine shop on Kepler Street, Ferris worked swiftly under a dim light, unbolting a small, compact machine from the concrete floor. He is intent upon his work as he hears the back door open. Is that you, Ken? I'll be finished here in a minute. Then we... What's the idea? Working pretty late, aren't you, Ferris? Why, sure. Anything wrong with being industrious? Well, that depends on what you're being industrious about. Isn't this an odd time to be removing machinery? Well, this is my machine, and I got a right to be in this shop. Any more questions? Yes. When you heard us come in, you thought it was someone named Ken. James Ken? Hmm? Well, no, no, Charlie Ken, one of the fellows in the shop. He promised to come back and give me a hand. Uh, by the way, what kind of a machine is that? What does it do? Yes, we'd like to know. Well, it's, it's a small electronic furnace, purified metal. You put the sample in this chamber here. Then you turn on the current, and the induction coil around the chamber produces an intense heat inside the metal. Hey, which... Commander, look out! Have watch Ferris. I'll... Ken. Oh, let's get this machine out of here before they recover from the ray gun blast. So what if they come out of it before we're finished? In that case, Ferris, well, this machine shop is a veritable treasure house of fatal accidents. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. This is Dick Tufel reporting on America's most heavily armed fighter interceptor, the Northrop Air Force Scorpion F-89D. In a moment, we'll hear from the test pilot on this plane, Bob Long, Korean jet ace with a record of six MiGs in six weeks. Primary job of the Scorpion is to protect our country from invading aircraft. Speed more than 600 miles per hour. Weight 20 tons. Now, Bob Long recorded at Edwards Air Force Base. You know, a fella has to be in top condition to test fly a fast aircraft such as a Scorpion. That's why I always make it a rule, sleep well and eat well. So, for breakfast, I pick a cereal like Rice Chex or Wheat Chex. They're chucked full of energy and really taste good. You'll like them. Make sure you stay in condition the way Bob Love, Phil Houghton, and other top test pilots do. Every morning, eat a good nourishing breakfast with Rice Chex or Wheat Chex. The cereals that are tops three ways. Tops for taste, for size, and for real get-up-and-go. That's Chex, Rice, or Wheat. Remember, they're tops with America's top pilots. And now back to our space patrol adventure, the counterfeit atoms. James Kent, posing as a legitimate collector of rare gems, has stolen millions of credits worth of jewels from reputable dealers without even revealing his method of operation. Borrowing real gems, he places them in a machine that can duplicate minerals atom by atom by transforming energy into a temporary form of matter. Kent and his accomplice, Ferris, keep the original gems and return the copies, which in a short time revert back to energy. Following a thin lead, Buzz and Happy apprehend Ferris in a machine shop in Jupiter City. But James Kent takes the space patrollers by surprise and renders them unconscious with a ray gun. Right now, as the effects of the ray gun wear off, Buzz and Happy get to their feet. Now well, they're gone, sir. And so is that machine. I had no terrace again anywhere, but... I never got a good look at Ken. Neither did I. I was fine for a second as he left us, and his face was in a shadow. Hey, Commander, that machine must tie in with the jewel theft. But how? I don't know. Maybe Kent treats the gems with something when he borrows them, and then later he turns on that machine, and radiations make the stones disappear. Well, the question is, do the gems reappear inside the machine? 
Sounds fantastic, but... Oh, unless Kent and Ferris actually got the jewels, there wouldn't be any point in them making them disappear from the vaults. Well, there's at least one more possibility. But we'll go into that later. Let's get back to headquarters and send out an alert on Ferris and Kent. The two jewel thieves are now in a private cruiser, outward bound from Jupiter, in a vector calculated to avoid a regular space lane. That experience in the machine shop ought to convince you, Kent. The space patrol and the gem dealers are wise to us. Not necessarily. I still say the jewelry racket is finished. Let's take a shot at duplicating currency. Maybe it'll pass. Do you like the job of putting it in circulation? When it might vanish into thin air when you hand it to a sucker? Uh, yes, I see what you mean. Say, I've got it. Here's a gimmick that'll keep us inside the law. We'll duplicate ray guns, blast guns, and other weapons. They're metal. And they'll be a thief to turn out by the hundreds. Yes, but they won't be permanent. Besides, we'd be making and selling weapons without a license. How does that keep us inside the law? I suppose we sell a coca blaster on the fancy. <laughs> Is our customer going to complain to the space patrol? No, oh, she's got something. We'll have nothing to worry about. Yeah. Except Corey. If we only got rid of him, then we had a chance back at the machine shop. Are you crazy? Right now, we'd be known murderers instead of suspected jewel thieves. But don't worry. I'll think of a way to get rid of Corey so no one can trace us. Yes, I've got it. Why? Suppose we take a few grains of poison with a mineral base and duplicate it in our machine. We slip it to Corey. It does its work, and then it vanishes. The best doctor in the solar system couldn't find a trace of it. Yeah. It's the perfect crime. Ah, there's just one drawback. How do we give it to Corey? Just leave that to me. I'll attend to it personally after we get to Saturn. Now to figure out our new identity. As Buzz and Happy prepare to leave Jupiter, a strange spacegram message arrives at Jupiter City headquarters, addressed to the commander. Buzz reads it, and then hands it to Happy. Hmm. Well, do you think this is on the level, sir? Well, the situation being what it is, we have to investigate every lead. Huh? Oh, but who is this Arnold Block? He calls himself an amateur lapidary. Well, what's that? A lapidary is a man who cuts and polishes precious stones. And he says he can give you information about these mysterious disappearances. Yeah. See here, he says, my connections with gem dealers and collectors and all the planets sometimes brings me in touch with sordid matters that usually are best to ignore. Mm-hmm. But when the very livelihood of honest craftsmen is endangered by organized thieves, I must speak out, even at personal risk. And Father Ronnie says he's staying at the Hotel Polaris in Saturn City and will give me the details if I need him to laugh. Saturn? A long way to go for a bike to eat. What we'll do on that thing for the next inspection? So it won't be much out of the way to stop at Saturn for a couple of hours. And we'll see what Arnold Block knows about this. But just as a precaution happens, we've each Saturn, I want you to put on civilian clothes. While I'm with Block, you sit at another table and keep an eye on things. Hours later, in the large dining room of the Hotel Polaris in Jupiter City, Commander Corey sits at a secluded table with Arnold Block. Anyone who had known James Kent might notice a faint resemblance. But on second glance, he would observe the greater differences in manner, color of hair, and general appearance. As the commander and Block converse over their meal, the dead happy, in civilian clothes, watches unobtrusively from the table across the room. Mr. Block, you say the next job is being on the Apex Jewelry Company in Venus City. Now, how do you know that you've I didn't mean to say the next job. I'm sorry. I should have said it's one of their intended operations. You know who these men are? Could you identify them? Well, that would be rather difficult. You see, I was examining some margin oak. What's the matter? Isn't that the governor of Saturn just sitting up to my table over there? Hmm? There's some people in the way just now. Oh, no. Are much bigger now. But uh, to get back to our subject, Mr. Block. Oh, my. I just noticed the time. Will you excuse me a moment? I have to make a space of one call. Important business. I just can't put it out. The course, go right ahead. But we'll only take a minute. That's your signal coming out. I'm coming over in here. We're going to drop something at the time. And we're not going to watch the world. I'll see us coming. Yes, sir. Lock that trinket in your glass and you turn your head a minute ago. I think that means. That's how you can make space for the car. Here, I'll get all traces of the car. I'll get the car. The 
few moments later, Arnold Block returns to the table and Buzz resumes the question. The luncheon over, the commander meets Happy in the street outside the hotel. Block made a call all right, sir. But I couldn't face it. He was in a pay booth and the others were all occupied. I'm afraid that might happen. But don't worry. I'll have the coins removed and examined for Block's fingerprints. We'll also know the distance of the coin. Well, you know the time you made it. I don't know. It's down enough so the automatic recorder at Space Event Center can help us. Yes, but how are you going to tell which fingerprints are dodged? I can tell you that. Those are the screen. When I get up from the table, I slip it in my pocket. What do you think, sir? About Block? I don't know. The information you gave me is pretty general. I didn't make that little remote of Kent and Thomas. Hey, how about that milk? You didn't drink any of it, I hope. No. I don't know if milk was in a potted pan and blocked it away from the table. Oh, can't they? Don't trust it. Sorry, sir. I was still the milk. I managed to slip the glass in my jacket pocket. Doesn't make a very neat ball, does it? I'm going to get it to the lab to have it analyzed. Later that afternoon, in the office reserved for him at Space Patrol Headquarters in Jupiter City, Commander Corey checks through a stack of identification cards as Happy enters. Well, I guess I must have been imagining things, Commander. What's the report from the lab? Negative. There was absolutely nothing in that milk. Mm. Uh, except milk. But still, from where I sat, it, it looked like Arnold Block deliberately got you to look the other way and dropped something in your glass. Well, I guess he was just reaching for the sugar or something. Possibly. Oh, about the phone call. Anything on that yet? Yes, sir. In a way, it turned out to be simpler than I expected. The space phone service man had just collected from the coin boxes an hour before, so there weren't very many coins to check. But there were no coins with Arnold Block's fingerprints. Hmm. They wouldn't make a call after me. So what was he doing in the booth? He blocked me the call. The Draco City. Space phone sent his automatic report to it. was the only call of that kind made from that particular space phone during the period in Bar. Who was the call to? To find out? Mm-hmm. A perfectly legitimate call to the Draco Tool Company. They make gem cutting instruments. I'm doing some special work for a Mr. Arnold Block. Hmm. And Block must be on the level. Hey, wait. How, how did he make that call without dropping a coin in the slot? He did drop it. He from the register the half cut coin. That mechanism was proved to. Well, yes, sir. But didn't you say that there wasn't any half credit coin in the machine? Nothing with Block's fingerprints? That's right. I don't get it. I think maybe it'll all clear up when we talk to Mr. Block. I've got an agent watching him. Now have help me check through these records. Almost at the edge of the Saturn City spaceport is a metal fence bearing the sign Saturn Salvage Company. At the rear of the lot, scattered with heaps of rusting metal, is a small shed. Inside the structure, Ferris regulates the controls of the machine, while a man in an ill-fitting suit looks on. It's working fine. I've turned out three dozen since this morning. I'd better knock off for a while, Ferris. Just one more, Kent. Don't call me Kent, even when we're alone. Someday you'll make a slip in public. Sorry, Glock. Well, I guess this one is cooking up. You know, it's hard remembering who you are. Before Kent, it was Drake, and now it's Block. You well, we shouldn't have any trouble. As Block, I don't look anything like Kent, do I? No, you don't. It's amazing what scissors, a hair dye job, and a sloppy suit will do for a man. It's not just in the appearance, Ferris. It's here in the mind. I think there's a different personality. I walk differently, move differently. You know? Well, see if you can tell these apart. Two black guns. One's the real thing, and the other one is a duplicate. Oh. They're the same. Way the same. And they look the same. Which is the duplicate? The one in your left hand. And it fires just like a real one, too. After the second, it becomes a ghost and banshee. I put them here with the others. Before we try to unload any of these weapons, we've got to know just how long they'll exist as matter. That's what I'm doing now. See those figures on the bench where the guns are? When I pull one of them out of the duplicator, I mark down the time. Uh, we'll set up a real system when we get to Neptune. We get a bunch of orders, then unload fast and disappear before our product does. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, have you heard anything about Corey? No. He looks fine during lunch. <laughs> You know, those space patrol medics will have a real embarrassing mystery on their hands. What happened to Commander Corus? And it's talking. It's looking outside. Just going out there. You didn't suspect anything. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. hey, as I was saying, the Jupiter Giants don't have a chance against the Pluto Demon. Not with Edlinger pitching. And. All right, both of you, get your hands up. Hold it, Ferris. You heard the commander. Wait in that table, Kent. Let's see those hands in the air. Are you sure you have the right man? Kent, block whatever it is. Now move out here and move fast. 
This is a blaster, Corey. Now drop that ray gun. Don't be a fool. Can't you through? Yeah? You've got a ray gun. I've got a blaster. If you fire, so will I. We'll both drop. But I'll be able to get up again. He's right, Commander. Well, the cadet's got sense. Now toss those ray guns down and Ferris and I'll be on our way. You're not going anywhere, Chance. Corey, I haven't got time to play games. This is your last chance. I'm going to squeeze the trigger and blast you. Commander, his gun vanished. That's what I was waiting for. <coughs> Keep out of it, Ferris. I... All right, Kent. You want some more, or do you want to quit while you're losing? Now get up. Tap our watch. You scoop up those glasses. It's your fault, Ferris. If I'd had a real gun instead of one of those duplicates, what do you mean my fault? You were the one. All who... right, cut it out, both of you. Okay, Corey. Where did I slip up? Was it the disguise is blocked? No. No, I never had a good look at you, Kent. You got fired. And it was the poison in the milk. You saw me drop it in. No, and it wasn't the gun stealing that finally attracted you. Know. The thing that made me link block and tent was a simple, everyday space phone call to Draco City. What are you talking about? I made that as block. Yeah. But for a big time crook, you're pretty cheap. You used a disappearing half credit coin. When you gypped the company on that space phone call, we, uh, got your number. Ha, 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 ha. An exciting action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Space Patrollers, you all know what sound effects are. You hear them all the time on your radios. But listen to these musical sound effects and see if you can guess what we're doing with Rice Checks and Wheat Checks. Yep, Space Patrollers, that's a big bowl filling up with Rice Checks or Wheat Checks. Man, oh man, it even sounds delicious. It tastes better yet. Those triple oven toasted biscuits are tops for taste. Now we're pouring on the cream. Listen, you can almost hear those crisp, crunchy checks filling up with that cream. And then for the first bite. Wow, what a bite. Size just right. Because checks are made of that modern bite size design. Make some tops for size. <laughs> Hey, that's you blasting off for a big day of action. After a good nourishing breakfast with checks, the cereal's tops for get up and go. So, gang, go get rice checks today. Get wheat checks, too. The official bite sized cereals of the Space Patrol. In the red and white checkerboard package, with the picture of Commander Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside. Rice checks, wheat checks. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are walking through a warehouse at the Terra Spaceport where two suspected criminals are standing by the controls of a loading crane. Well, that's Zanker, all right, Commander. Yes, I'm going to how much of that cargo up there in the crane is stolen. There's probably plenty of it. Uh-oh, he sees us. Now, just a minute, Van Carr. Commander, release that holding brake and drop the load on there. Look out, Hap, Move! Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story... Formula for Crime, when Rice Checks and Wheat Checks again present Space Patrol! Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Cameron as Commander Corey, and then Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston. Produced and directed by Larry Robertson. Executive producer, Helen Moser. Other players were Bela Kovach, Norman Jolly, Ken Mayer, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Rice Checks and Wheat Checks present exciting action on Space Patrol! This program is broadcast for armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. <laughs>